Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is gonna rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. You know, I, I love coming here. You know, I get a chance to, to travel and speak at different places. And, you know, sometimes I get to go to places that I know that God's given me a word uh, for that particular place and in that particular season. But then there's some places that God sends me, like coming back home here at Elevate, which just brings us life. And it just brings me so much joy to be here. Uh, you guys just energize me. Thank you. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. So, um, you know, Pastor Mauricio in Virginia, they're celebrating the 23rd wedding anniversary, and, and uh, it's awesome. 23 years, that's great. And uh, we've been, we've known them for almost 15 of those years, and, <clears throat> and uh, I just can't tell you how much of a blessing they've been. Uh, if you would turn with me to the book of Genesis, we're going to read today out of, out of the book of Genesis, chapter 25. <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to talk about hunger. So it's the 10 o'clock service. If you guys came to church hungry today, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I want you to be hungry. Uh, but, but, but I want you guys to be hungry uh, spiritually for the word today because I, I want to talk about what happens when we're hungry. If you read Genesis chapter 25, we're going to read from verse 24. It says, when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first came out, was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grabbing Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why he was called Edom. Edom is, uh, it also means red in Hebrew. And so Jacob replied, first, sell me a birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate, he drank, then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Father, I thank you for an opportunity to share your word today. Lord, I pray that you open our ears to hear your word and our hearts to receive your word. Father, I thank you that your power, your presence, and your Holy Spirit is in this place today. Father, we just lift up pastors Mauricio and Virginia to you uh, while they're traveling, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, uh, that, that as they go out and as they're, they're celebrating you, Father God, that, that, you're, that, that you're speaking through them as they're out preaching the gospel right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, now listen, I, I like the story of Jacob. Jacob is probably one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And one of the reasons is, is because Jacob has made a lot of mistakes in his life. And if there's one thing that I am privy to, it's making a lot of mistakes. I don't know about you, but I've made quite a few. And so, um, but Jacob was set up. His whole, his whole name, the name Jacob in the Hebrew, it means surplanter, hill grabber, it means deceiver. And so the identity that he was given at birth was the word deceiver. So I don't know about you, but can you imagine the identity crisis that that must have or that must take from the very moment that you were born, you're being called a deceiver. And sometimes, you know, that's what happens is we get labeled with an identity immediately and then we start to live up to it because that's exactly what he did. In this story, we read about how he, uh, how, he, how, he, how he bought the birthright from Esau. And then we also read a little bit later about how he stole Esau's blessings. And, and then we read a little bit about, uh, later about how God ends up um, sending him to his, 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 his uh, father-in-law, who was a bigger deceiver than he was, and then he ends up uh, getting a taste of his own medicine, and then he comes to a place of repentance. And then uh, before you know it, he, he, he wrestles with God. And then he has an encounter with God, and then he has a heart of repentance. And God used him to lay the foundation of which would ultimately become the 12 tribes of Israel, which is usually a, a right that was reserved for the firstborn. But his identity crisis came because he was the secondborn. Even in the womb, 
Even in the womb, they wrestled because he wanted to be first. When Esau was born first, Jacob came out grabbing his heel. Why? Because he wanted to be first. And so his entire identity was the fact that he came out second. He was the second born son. And so he struggled with that identity crisis. And I want to tell you here today, listen, if you're here and you've been struggling with what the world has called you or what people have labeled you and it doesn't line up with what the word of God has called you and what the God and what the word of God called you to be, it's okay. You're in good hands in this place today. And so, um, and so uh, he's looked at as one of the heroes of the Bible, but in the beginning he kind of lived a, a pretty shady life. And if you look at the story from the surface, this has got to be probably one of the Worst negotiations I've ever seen in my entire life. And you really think about what he said here. Esau came in and he came in, he came in famished. He was hungry. And then he said, he said, some of your birthright. So let's talk about a birthright for a minute. What a birthright is, okay, it is, it, it is the right of a double portion of the father's inheritance. So what that means is when Isaac when Isaac were to die, that means his estate, he has two sons, that means his estate will get divided into three parts. Two-thirds would go to Esau because he was the firstborn. One-third would go to Jacob because he was the secondborn. But listen to what he said. He didn't say, hey, Esau, I'll give you some of this stew if you trade your birthright with me. That's not what he said. He said, if you sell me your birthright. So in other words, what he's saying is he's saying, hey, Esau, if you forfeit every single thing that the father's laid aside for you for this one moment, for this one thing, I'll give it to you. I'll give you this, this one moment of pleasure for all that the father has for you. He was saying, give me everything. So it's a bad trade. It's a, it's, a, it's a bad deal. And then I thought, who would make a trade like this? And then I think about it, and we all do it all the time, every one of us. And so you really think about this. There's a couple of things I want to point out. Number one, success doesn't determine your identity. If you look in, um, in verse 27, it says, the boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter. So he, 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 he grew to be a skillful hunter. He grew in his skill, but he didn't grow in who he was. And so what I'm trying to say is this, is that, and some of us are, are like that today. We grow in our skill, and we start to identify with what we do, and we start to identify with the skills we have but instead of really taking on the identity of, 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 of growing in our character. And so what I'm trying to say is he got really good at killing his food, but he never learned how to control his appetite. And so... Um, and, and so and no matter how good you get at your skill, your skill won't satisfy you. It says in verse 29, it says, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. So he came in from the open country. He went out to do what he always did. He went out to work in his skill, but he came back empty handed. The skill that he had didn't satisfy him in that particular moment. And so it didn't fulfill him, and he came back famished. And so to understand why Esau did what he did, you kind of have to understand the state that Esau was in. The state that he was in, he was hungry, he was famished. Which brings me to this next point. Be careful who you talk to when you're in a place of vulnerability. Be careful who you reach out to. Don't reach out to people who, have your best, who don't have your best interests at heart. If you listen to the wrong people when you're vulnerable... Chances are you'll lose what's valuable, you know. Don't, don't go talking to Susie who actually, when you have a, when you have a problem at your boss, don't, don't go talking to Susie who uh, actually hates her job too, and then you start venting to Susie. Next thing you know, both of you guys are unemployed. I'm just saying, <laughs> be careful who you talk to when, you, when you're vulnerable because you might lose what's valuable. You know, I've got a friend back in Clarksville, and uh, we're both in the Army together, and um, he calls me one day, and he's a big hunter. I like, I like using him as an illustration because he's a hunter. Like Esau, hunting is really big in Tennessee. And so uh, he calls me one day, and he says, Bruce, I have a huge favor, man. I'm like, yeah, what's up? He says, you know, um, I, need, I need about $350. I'm like, what's going on, man? He says, well, you know, my, 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 um, my wife's mom died, and we've got to get our family back, uh, back home. And 
I took my hunting equipment to the pawn shop, and he's got like thousands of dollars worth of like archery and hunting equipment. And he's like, I took it to the pawn shop, and they were only going to give me two hundred dollars for it. And so, uh, but but I'm about three fifty short. He says, Bruce, if I if I bring this hunting equipment to you, could you hold on to it as collateral and, and, and loan me the money? And I said, Hey, man, listen, meet me in the parking lot at work. So I drove to the parking lot and. I reach in my pocket, and I pull out five $100 bills, and I, ha- I handed it to him. And, uh, and he says, okay, good. Well, uh, my, my, my bow is in the back. Let me get it for you. And I said, no, nah, man, keep your bow. I don't want. I don't even know how to shoot a bow. I don't, what am I going to do with it? And then he goes, he goes, yeah, but that way you know I'll pay you back. And I looked at him, and I said, man, I don't loan money to people. Go take it and go home and be with your family, man. And then he looked at me, and he was, he was in, 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 in amazement. And I said, listen, I want to tell you something, man. Why would you go to the pawn shop? They don't have your best interest in mind. Be careful who you go to when you're vulnerable or you might lose what's valuable. And that's all I'm saying. And in this particular case, he went to Jacob, his brother, in a vulnerable state, and he ended up losing one of the most valuable things, which was his birthright. Quick, let me have some stew. I'm famished. You know, and I, I had another preacher friend of mine I'll point this out one day. He's like, Esau. You're a hunter. You're big. You're hairy. Jacob is a mama's boy at home in the tents cooking stew. Just beat him up and take the stew. You don't have to sell him anything. But see, what happens is when we get so weak and we get so hungry, we forget where our strength lies. We forget the strength that God put on the inside of us when we get, when we get weak. And, so, and that's what we have to realize is that when we're weak, our trust isn't, is, isn't in our ability. Our trust is in the Lord. And so we forget that. Listen, it's not the first time you got to notice in the mail. God provided then, he'll provide now. It's not the first time sales have been slow and sales have been down. If God provided then, God will provide now. But when we get into a weak state, sometimes we forget how strong God made us. So we have this rule in my house. And that's we never go to the grocery store hungry. And there's a reason for that. Because you look up and it's like all of a sudden you get home and you start to unpack and you go, did I really need to buy six boxes of cookies? <laughs> like why? Why do I have four gallons of ice cream? Because when you're walking through the aisle hungry, every single thing you see looks good to you, especially if you had it and haven't had it in a long time. You know, you walk by and it's like, oh, I haven't had Oreos in years. <laughs> well, there's a reason I haven't had Oreos in years. I've got a three-year-old and a five-year-old, a three-year-old and a five-year-old at home. When they eat Oreos, they turn into little terrorists, so we don't buy them. But we forget that when we're hungry and we grab on anything that we think is going to sustain us and give us pleasure even for a moment. You see, and then we have to remember that, you know. Um, I, I got news for you. There's even when you're hungry, when you go for something attractive, there's a reason that God took you out of that situation. There's a reason that God told you to stop hanging out at that place. There's a reason that God pulled you out of that relationship in the first place. So when we get into a vulnerable, hungry state, don't turn around and go back and start grabbing the things that God pulled you away from. You know, something my wife has uh, been dealing with me uh, lately is, uh, you know, we... Launching a church is, you know, keeps you pretty busy. <laughs> Transitioning out of the army, and I'm, I'm finishing graduate school at, at Lipscomb, which is like the, the sister school here to Pepperdine. And and uh, one of the things that my wife has been working on with me a lot is that I'll, I'll go sometimes the entire day, and, and and like half the day go by, and I haven't eaten anything. And then so the day goes by, and all of a sudden I'm famished. And then I'll go pull up at the drive-thru and, and grab stuff. And, and so what my wife started doing is, you know, she started making sure I had, like, little healthy snacks in the car. Like, she'll put, you know, uh, some, some nuts in the car, and she'll make sure I have, like, some fruit in my backpack. And, you know, just things like that because what she's really doing is she's, she's kind of setting me up to kind of meal prep so that I don't go around hungry and just grab anything. And uh, on one day... You know, she wants to set me up with healthy options. And so, and so one day, um, you know, and I think that's for her benefit more so than mine. <laughs> because, I, you know, I'll be honest with you, I, I did come home, you know, like I have this habit of I get up in the middle of the night and I like to snack on stuff. Like, you know, I'll just get up at 1 o'clock in the morning and I go to the refrigerator. And my idea of a snack is like, hmm, I think I'll make a sandwich. And so, uh, 
So one night I come home and, uh, well, one night I get out of the bed and I go downstairs and I go to the refrigerator door and I notice that the bathroom scale is magically standing right in front of the refrigerator. <laughs> and uh, I didn't put it there. So I'm just thinking somebody's probably trying to give me some sort of subliminal message here. And so, um, <laughs> but one day I'm at school and it's, it's, I'm, I'm going to school in the evening and I get a text message from my wife and she says, hey, don't eat anything. I'm cooking dinner. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's cool, right? And then she sends me a picture of what she's cooking. And she sends me a picture of this pot, and on the inside, you know, she's got a picture of the inside of the pot. And there's this pot roast there, and then she's got the rosemary laid out nice right on top of it. And you got to see the vegetables laying around there. You see the steam coming out the pot, and the herbs are just lined up nice. And I'm looking at this, and my mouth is watering. And, and I remember she said, don't eat anything before you come home because... I'm cooking, and I listen, I think my wife is the best cook in the world. I'll fight you over it. She is. She's awesome. She's amazing. And so she, she cooks this. So she's got this amazing pot roast that she's making for me, and she sends me this picture. But here's the problem. I'm already hungry. I've got 30 minutes left before this class is over. And plus, where my, class, where my school is in Nashville is about an hour drive from where I live in Clarksville. And I'm thinking to myself, so when I see this amazing, beautiful thing that's waiting for me at home, what do you think happens? I get even more hungry. Now I'm not just hungry, I'm starving. But then I thought, you know what, I'll, 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 uh, I'll honor my wife's you know, wishes and her request. And so I didn't go out and I didn't go stop at the drive-thru. But instead, I went downstairs to the vending machine <laughs> where there were snacks and the vending machine is, I love it because it's owned by a company called Lance Vending Machine Services. And they have this logo on some of their machines and it says, it says, don't go around hungry. <laughs> How ironic is that? The only reason that I'm sitting here buying a Snickers bar from your machine in the first place is because I was going around hungry. But had I packed a snack, had I been walking around with maybe, I don't know, some carrots or some celery sticks or something like that, then I wouldn't be you know, filling myself with junk. And listen, I know I'm talking about food right now, but I'm using the food to illustrate what our, our spiritual state is. And I know I'm talking about being physically hungry, but sometimes we do that you know, spiritually where we're walking around so hungry. But here's the great thing. In this church, you're already meal prepped and you don't even know it. You've got your Elevate app and your smartphone right in your back pocket. You pull out the Elevate app. You can watch the sermons online. You can take notes. You can read the word of God. You can go back and connect with other people that are here. All sorts of things you can do right here in your back pocket. You guys are already meal, meal prepped. Look at somebody and say, pack a snack. <laughs> and so, but we go around all week famished. We come to church on Sunday, and then Monday goes by, and we didn't pray on Monday. We didn't worship on Tuesday, didn't read the word on Wednesday, didn't go to small group on Thursday. And then Friday comes along, and you're spiritually starving, and you're at home all alone. And then a voice whispers to you, hey, man, nobody's here. It's just one website. And if you're spiritually starving... Sometimes we crave love, and if we're not getting our source of love from, from God, who's the source of love, we crave love, and then we end up settling for sex when really what, what, what we ended up craving was in him. And what we end up settling for will never satisfy us in the first place. We settle for things that look like it could be pleasing in a moment, but it will never satisfy us spiritually. So times get hard. And the voice whispers in your ear, it's okay if you compromise your integrity at work. Nobody's looking. Besides, the bills are due. But if we're hungry and we're spiritually hungry, we compromise. Don't sell your identity for a moment today. And it's amazing because I feel like our nation, because this whole thing started as an identity crisis. This whole thing started because Esau and Jacob didn't know who they were. We had one person that wanted to be something that he wasn't, and we had somebody else who didn't know who he was. And I think our nation is probably one of the, has right now one of the biggest identity crises I've ever seen in our nation. We've got people right now that, that, that 
that are struggling with who they are, with whose they are, what gender they are, what species they are, what race they are, what defines them. And sometimes, you know, and listen, there may be somebody uh, contemplating a bad decision, and I want to tell you today, listen, stop. Don't make a decision while you're hungry. Get filled with the Spirit of God. Get filled with the Word of God. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Allow God to speak to you and let him guide you and tell you what to do. I wonder how different would this story be if Esau just had one friend. Just had one friend just walk up to him and say, uh, hey, Esau, um, hey, dude, this is a bad deal. You know, you're not yourself when you're hungry. Here, have a Snickers bar. You know, I just, I just, I just, listen, if, if, if there may be someone here contemplating doing something and making a major life-altering decision, well, I want to tell you, I want to be that friend of you today. Don't go around hungry. And so um, if you look at the end, he didn't even enjoy it. It says, then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and got up and left. It didn't even say he enjoyed it. It would have been, you know, the story would have been different if you read it and it says, and Esau ate the stew and it was the most delicious stew that he had ever had in his life. As a matter of fact, the stew was amazing. But no, it didn't say that. He ate, he drank. And got up and left. Didn't even get a phone call the next morning. Which brings me to the next point. Don't compromise what you want most for what you want now. Notice he said, quick, give me a bowl of stew. I need it fast. I need it now. I'm starving. And there's three places in scripture where a person's been tempted to sell their birthright for a meal. There's three places, three main places that I want to show you. The first one is in, is in the book of Genesis. When you read in the book of Genesis, uh, here, here they are, Adam and Eve are walking in the garden with God, and then the serpent comes along to tempt Eve. And, and then what, is, what does the serpent say? The serpent says, hey, you know, eat of this fruit. And she says, and she says um, God said, if we eat it, we will die. And then the serpent replies, you will not die, for God knows when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. Well, what did he do? He used her appetite to challenge her identity. You see, it says, it said that God knows that when you eat it, you'll be like God. But they were already like God. The Bible says that God made man in his image. So we were already made in his likeness. And so that's what the enemy wants to do is he wants to come in and, and, and let you forget who you are and who you belong to and who created you and get you to challenge that identity in a state of vulnerability. And that's what he did to Eve in the garden. And that's what, that's what Jacob did to Esau. But then you fast forward to Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus in chapter 3, he was, he was just baptized by John the Baptist. And God said to him, and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So what did God do? He gave Jesus his identity. He said, this is my beloved son. But then the enemy comes in. And so Jesus, so Jesus you know, he, he, he was given that identity. He goes into the wilderness. He fasts and pray for 40 days. And then after being in a vulnerable state, after not eating for 40 days, it says in Matthew 4 and 3, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God. Wait, stop. What did God just say? This is my son whom I'm pleased. And then the enemy comes in and says, well, if you're the son of God, he was doing to Jesus the same thing that he did to Adam. If this is your identity, he was doing the same thing that Jacob did to Esau, sell me your birthright. But you see, he says, turn these, bread, turn these stones into bread. But see, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus, even though that he may have been physically hungry, he wasn't famished spiritually. And I know this because whatever is on the inside of you, when you're squeezed, it's going to come out of you. And so he may have been hungry, and he may not have had any food physically, but spiritually he was full of the word. Because what happened is when the enemy came in to squeeze him, suddenly suddenly, uh, what was in him was the word, and the word came out of him. Because he said, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so when you're being squeezed, and you're being under pressure, and if you're full of God's word, that word is going to go out of you. 
That's why it's important not to go around spiritually starving. But see, when that didn't work, the enemy came and tempted Jesus a second time. And this time, it says that the enemy, he, the devil took him up into the holy city and, and took him to the highest points of the temple. And then what did he do? He went to his identity again. Except this time, he used scripture. He said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So this time he used scripture. And sometimes, and this is why it's important to spend time with God, because sometimes that's what the enemy will do. The enemy will, will show you something that makes, makes it look like it's spiritual. It makes it look like it may be from God. But all the entire time that there's deception behind it. So, and, and that's what was going on in this situation. He says, well, here, tell you what, do you want to use scripture? Uh, here, th this, is, this, this looks like it could be of God. Why don't you try this instead? But see, Jesus, again, he wasn't starving spiritually. And so what comes in comes out. And so he said, and so, um, and so Jesus answered him, he says, uh, it is also written, do not put the, the Lord your God to the test. So he came back with a word. But then this is my favorite one, verse 8. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. So why did the enemy do this? Because this all had to do with identity. Remember, the enemy challenged Adam in the garden. Adam and Eve gave their birthright for a meal. Remember, God gave them a birthright. God gave man dominion over the earth. Jesus came back to get that dominion back. That's the sole purpose for Jesus being here. Jesus came so that dominion that man lost in the garden, he came so he can come and get that dominion back and give it back to you and I. So here the enemy is and said, hey, Jesus, this is what you want the most. You want it. The keys to the kingdom. Well, I'll give you everything if you just bow down and worship me. Just do that now and, and you can have it all. But see, Jesus wasn't about to give up what he wanted most for what he wanted now. And so Jesus came back with the word and he says, it is written, you know, you shall only worship the Lord your God. Now, I want you to realize the important significance of this. His identity was already solidified when God said, this is my beloved son. But when he did that, he showed the enemy he knew who he was. That's why the enemy fled. You see, because at this point, and I want you guys to realize something. This is why worship is so important. Because it's the only thing God cannot give himself. Because in order to worship something, there has to be something higher than you. And, there, and he is the most high. He is the Lord of lords. There is no, no one higher. And so when the enemy comes up and says, hey, I want you to come worship me, he's like, Worship you, devil. I can't even worship myself. And so that's what I'm here to tell you today. So Jesus came, and he went, and he grabbed that identity back. He's like, I'm not going to compromise what I want the most. I'll go to the cross. I'll endure the suffering. I'll endure the pain. I'll do it because this assignment is bigger than me. I know God's got a, a, a much greater assignment. But he wasn't like Esau. He didn't go, quick, give me the keys to the kingdom. He kept going. And so this enemy was fighting a losing battle. But this is where he gets you. He wants to give you, get you in your place of weakness, the place where you're the most vulnerable. The enemy, he's not going to tempt me with this. <laughs> the enemy's not going to come at me like, hey, Bruce, I got this awesome plate of Brussels sprouts for you, man. Dude, you should, you should totally grab this. Now, listen. This may bring life to my body. This may be nourishing. This may be what I need. This may, what, may be what, what sustains me. But, but see, it's, it's, it's kind of raw and it needs to be cooked. And I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really tempting that. See, this isn't, this isn't ready right now. And now if it was my only option, if this is the only thing I had to eat when I'm starving and I'm famished, I'm probably going to go for a big plate of Brussels sprouts. But see, the enemy doesn't do that. He knows that even though this is what God has set up for you, he's going to come out and say, hey, you don't need that. Look at this. Woo! And then you start, it's like it's, oh, 
oh, it's amazing. It smells awesome. And you start thinking about, like, man, this is good. And you start thinking about the, the lettuce and the tomato and the sauce and the meat that they put on it. And it just smells amazing. You got that fresh baked bread. And you start thinking, wow, oh, I, I could definitely go for this. And, and I am hungry, after all. I haven't been really in my work this week, and I really haven't spent time with God this week, and I am, I am kind of hungry. But you know what? Um, yeah, you know, my wife, she put that scale in front of the refrigerator, and she's, you know what I mean? I, I don't really need the extra carbs. And so you set it down because what happens is if we go around spiritually hungry, sometimes we can have enough resistance to, to, to walk away and resist the enemy on our own. But then what happens when he pulls out the big guns. <laughs> Woo! Lord! Why? Why would you do this? Listen, I live in the South. There's nothing more tempting than fried chicken. I, I know this is what I need, but this isn't ready yet. And this is ready right now. And it smells amazing. It looks good. It smells good. Mm. It tastes good. But how do we get to this place? How do we get to this place in the first place? You know, we get here because what happens is God's given us a birthright. He's given us a promise. He's given us a promise. God's given you joy. It's a gift. God... The devil can't come take your joy. But what he can't do is to get you to eat an entire bowl of grumbling. God's given you peace. He didn't give you worry. He can't get you to give up your peace. But what he can do is get you to eat a giant worry sandwich. And so we spend our time worried about the promises that God gave us a lot of times when God gave us those promises anyway. My biggest problem is patience. Listen, I was a United States Army drill sergeant. I want something done. I want it yesterday, and it has to be done right. And God forbid I have to ask for something twice. Because, and I think God has a sense of humor to take me from a, from, a, from a job like an Army drill sergeant where you have to display absolutely zero patience and tolerance and then make me a pastor where you have to probably be the most patient person in the world. And so, <laughs> but it's okay because God, God put me through a patience development program. It's called Children. And so what happens is we get around our kids and like, like you know, my children, I, I don't know, but the thing is that at night, my kids, they turn into this, this thirsty, hungry, uh, you know, uh, narcoleptic, that, not narcoleptic, but this, this, this hungry, thirsty, insomniac person that needs a hug constantly. And so it's bedtime and you put them to bed, you tuck them in, you kiss them goodnight. And then two minutes later, daddy, what? I'm hungry. You just ate. Go to bed. A couple seconds later, Daddy, what? I'm thirsty. You just had water. I just gave you water. Go to sleep. Two minutes later, Daddy, what? What do you possibly want now? I just want a hug. No, you can't have a hug. Go lay down and go to sleep. Listen, don't look at me like that. <laughs> you know, I act like you yeah, ain't never done that before. I'm the only one, yeah. But see, here's the thing. I love my family. What I want most is a great relationship with my family. But see, what happens is the enemy, he would have come and said, hey, Bruce, here's a giant plate of impatience that you're going to dine on. And what ends up happening is we give up what we want most for what we want now. But then there's always the compromise. There's, also, there's always the in-between. I mean, maybe I don't have to go full Brussels sprout. You never go full Brussels sprout. Um, and um, maybe I don't necessarily, you know, want to just be totally over here and just in the world doing God knows what. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll compromise. After all, this, this has the best of both worlds. It's got both meat and veggies. <laughs> yeah, I might have to deal with a little bit of carbs in there. But see, that's what the enemy wants you to think. He'll show you what's, what it looks like on the outside. 
And then you might go for it and you might decide, I'll make the compromise and I'll pick what's in the middle. But what he doesn't show you is that it still leaves you empty on the inside. And so, and that's what compromise is. It's never going to fulfill you. You know, if you look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, it says this. This is what the writer of Hebrews is saying about Esau. He says, see that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, he wanted to inherit the blessing. He was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. So here he is, the writer of Hebrews. He uses Esau as an example of what it means to be godless. You ever notice in scripture that he's constantly referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Has it ever occurred to you that because Esau was the firstborn, that it was supposed to be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau? But he gave it all up for a birthright. And he couldn't change what he did. But you see, there was another firstborn son who didn't sell his birthright. And in Romans chapter 8, 29, it says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And what I want you to know today is that Jesus was the firstborn son that didn't sell his birthright. He was the firstborn of God, the begotten of the Father, and he wants to give you your birthright back. He paid for it. He bled for it. He was hung on the cross for it. And he rose again for it. For your birthright. So if you're hungry today, this is what I want you to know. That Jesus is also called the bread of life. Turn these stones into bread. He didn't need to turn the stones into something that he already was. But just like Esau, we've all compromised. All of us, every single one. And Jesus says, hey, I'm your big brother and I'm here to give you your birthright back. Let's just close your eyes with me. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.